and today we'll be uh, hosting with Dr. Robert Lewis. Dr. Lewis started his college career at a community college before transferring to UC to complete his BS degree. From there, he attended graduate school at UCSB with a focus on organic chemistry. He became a lecturer in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at UCSB and teaches the organic chemistry series. Dr. Lewis is passionate about organic chemistry and would love to talk about the field, his college experience, getting into undergraduate research, graduate school research, and any other related topic. So without further ado, Dr. Robert Lewis. All right. Um, hello. Uh, so um, you want me to just kind of go through that experience or was there questions I'm answering? <laughs> Yeah, so if you want, you could just start with introducing who you are, like your little, uh, your experience as a college um, uh, and a professor, so just, you know, a little background okay. information. Um, so yeah, I, as my little bio said, um, I did take the community college route. Um, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do when I was graduating high school. And since neither of my parents had gone to college, I couldn't really look to them for guidance for a lot of things. So. Um, that kind of just made me think, oh, well, I'll just save some money and go to community college and kind of figure things out for a little bit. So um, I took three years at uh, Moore Park Community College, and then I transferred down to UC San Diego through the, um, what was it called? The Transfer Guarantee Program. I can't remember. I think it's TAP or something like that. Um, but whatever that transfer program was, got me down to UC San Diego. So I was there for two years. And um, while I was at community college, I realized that chemistry was what I wanted to do. So that's when I transferred to UC San Diego, that's what my declared major was. Um, and it was nice because community college gave me the opportunity to do a lot of my prereqs and elective courses and just get all that stuff out of the way. So when I got to um, the UC, I got to spend my time doing almost exclusively chemistry. Like I had one quarter of five chemistry classes at a time. So it was nice to be able to focus on my given major and not have all these other things kind of getting in the way. Um, and while I was there, I got into some undergraduate research, which really turned me on in to like working in the lab and kind of working towards a um, kind of an overarching goal. And it really got me to realize that one of the things that I really wanted to be able to do with like my eventual career was to make a difference. And um, that kind of made me look more towards uh, working in, at a pharmaceutical company to maybe design and create some sort of like life-saving or altering compound. And that's kind of what my eventual goal was when I went to grad school. Um, but during grad school, I found that I liked teaching a lot more than I liked being in lab. And the, the kind of culture in research sometimes wasn't exactly what I wanted. So um, I you know, decided that I was gonna pursue teaching. So I did that for a lot of my um, little, around six years in grad school, I did a lot of uh, work trying to get better at teaching and take opportunities, get practice, and eventually I graduated and started working at SBCC and UCSB. So it's kind of got, got to, uh, that's how I got to where I am currently. So, um, yeah, I don't really, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't have anything else to add to that story, I guess, at this point. Um, is there another question I could respond to or? Yeah, thank you for sharing, Dr. Lewis. Um, so you talked about being a first-gen student and also a transfer student, um, but uh, what had led you to pursue a college education since you didn't have probably someone um, to look up to for that? Uh, you know, that I think I was just kind of part of that whole like generation where we were constantly told, like, if you don't go to college, you're not going to amount to anything. You're, it's just like, that's your only choice. If you don't go to college, you're going to be flipping burgers somewhere kind of thing. So it was something that my parents really were really kind of pushing me to do. Um, maybe not as directly as they uh, wanted to, but they were definitely uh, hinting at that pretty heavily. That that's what I needed to do. Um, since I didn't really have any other idea of uh, what to do after high school, I thought college was the right idea. Um, but yeah, Sorry, go, go ahead. 
Oh, mm-hmm. I was going to say, um, so as a transfer student, like, how was that experience, like, you know, I feel like the, the experience from community college to a four-year is very different. Yeah, it's, you know, there's things I liked about it and things I didn't, you know, I definitely missed out on the, um, that experience of, like, living in dorms and making friends with all the, you know, people that live with you or near you and stuff like that, so I, I didn't get that experience, but Um, I went to a community college in my hometown with, you know, several of my friends from college and um, a couple of them transferred down to UC San Diego along with me. So I had groups of friends already down there, but it was still pretty, uh, like, pretty easy to go and find new people to meet up with. And like, I I joined a cycling team, um, made friends through that. I met people in all my classes that I was taking. So um, you know, like, while I didn't have the same traditional experience, I don't feel like I missed out too much. Um, but the switch from a semester system to a quarter system was a little strange at first, because things just moved a lot quicker. But I think I ended up liking that a little bit more, just because at the community college, I got sick of my classes being in them for 16 weeks. But when you're in them for 10 weeks, it's kind of hard to get sick of them, because you're just going through them so much quicker. Um, so I kind of liked that fast paced aspect of it. Um, so yeah, the transfer was tough, but I think it was ultimately for me, I liked it a little bit more, the quicker system. And do you have any advice for current transfer students trying to get involved with research um, or anything like reaching out to professors? Yeah, um, I think uh, one thing that is just kind of surprising that I didn't really take advantage of is that there are so many resources available to students that like they're they're there, but you might not know about them. So like finding somebody who can point you in the right direction, whether it's a professor on campus, some somebody at the uh, on the student center or something like that, I can say like, hey, this is your problem you're having. Well, here's this resource that can help you. Like making sure you're using the available resources is very important. Um, if you are looking to get into undergraduate research, there are so many different programs on campus, uh, like is it California Alliance for Minority Participation. I was part of that one as a mentor while I was a grad student at UCSB. Um, there's RISE and um, is it FLAM or is it FLEM, FLAM, something like that. There's, there's so many acronyms out there, but there's like a lot of different uh, programs on campus that are great to try and look into because they can offer you financial aid and uh, give you like a a stipend to work over the summer, um, which is incredible for a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to stay in town over the summer. Um, And these programs also offer a lot of additional support. So things like preparation for GREs or give you little um, talks on how to give presentations and build posters, things like that, like all stuff that'd be useful for graduate school if that's the path you're looking to go down. So those programs are amazing and I highly recommend looking into them, but um, I didn't do any program like that when I was trying to get into undergraduate research. I mostly just tried doing cold calls essentially, just going, hey, professor, can I maybe work in your lab? And you know, eventually it worked. I found a professor that uh, was willing to let me Know, try some things out. I went to uh, their group meetings and just listened to all the graduate students talk about what they were doing until I found something that was interesting to me and tried to work with them for a while. So um, that's another route is just kind of contacting professors, contacting TAs and seeing if they have either you know a space for you in their lab or if they have any advice on what you can do because uh, they're all connected and knowledgeable about the situation and they've gone through it before. So um, I think that's, you know, as I was saying, like use your resources, those are your resources as well, your teachers, your professors, your TAs, all of them. So you're talking about like reaching out and stuff. So, and how would you recommend um, as an undergrad reaching out to those professors? Like, is there a perfect way to craft an email or how to approach them? Um, you know, it's going to kind of differ for each professor, but I think the best thing to do is obviously be, you know, as formal or respectful as you can right off the bat, just because, you know, you, you don't know what 
level they expect from you. Um, I personally am a bit more like relaxed with that. Like I don't care if my students call me Robert or whatever, like that doesn't bother me. Um, but some other professors might be bothered by that. So I think it's good to just, you know, be safe about it and say like, hey, professor or hey, doctor, whatever. Um, and then you can introduce yourself, say why you're, or say what you are like interested in, like, hey, I'm this person, I am a second, third year in this major. Um, I saw your research on, the, on your website and it's very interesting to me for this reason. I was wondering if we could sit down and talk about the possibility of, you know, maybe working in your lab. If you don't have any space available for me, then I'd still love to talk to you about research in general and maybe get any advice from you. Like, I mean, that's kind of the general message that I sent when I was looking and that I've uh, kind of given to some other students to um, use as a basis for when they're contacting professors as well. So short, to the point, introduction, um, and stoke their ego a little, say that you, you find their research interesting. And uh, also I think making that kind of connection, like say like, oh, I think your research is super interesting because you know your work with diabetes means a lot to me because I have a sister with diabetes or you know something like that. Like even making those types of connections show that like you're more invested in you know, doing the research than just, you know, padding your resume with something so that it looks better for med school. Because I think a lot of professors, they don't really know how committed the students are going to be. Because um, it's a big time investment to get an undergraduate trained and ready to work in the lab. So if they're only planning to stick around for like a quarter or two, it's not worth their time for the most part. So, um, you know, show your commitment. And I think that can go a long way too. Thank you. Um, we actually do have a question in the chat by Daniela, if you want to answer it, um, I could read it for you. It says, you said you wanted to be in pharmacy. Were there any other disciplines that you had an interest in pursuing? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know, that was like one of the things that I, I originally liked about chemistry was that it was so broad in what you can possibly do. Um, like you have chemists working at Ben and Jerry's developing new flavors. You have chemists at Maybelline making new foundations. You have chemists at pharmaceutical companies making new compounds or uh, materials companies making new types of plastics. Like there's so many different fields that you can go into with chemistry. And that kind of just, you know, huge possibilities is what draw, drew me to the subject. Um, but when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I was down at uh, UC San Diego and that's a, kind of a big pharmaceutical area. My organic chemistry professor used to work in industry for Pfizer, a huge pharmaceutical company. So part of what he brought into the classroom was some of his experiences and some of his stories from that. One of my lab instructors had also worked for a pharmaceutical company at some point and uh, he organized uh, some talks where people from industry would come and talk to us. So like during that time where I didn't know what I wanted to do, I kept getting exposed to that industry. Um, so that kind of kept making me more and more interested in it. Um, but also my research project while I was an undergrad was trying to make new antibiotics that worked on um, bacteria that were resistant to our normal ones. So like that was another thing that pushed me more in that direction. And like I said, I really wanted to do something that could make a difference. And to me, that that kind of stuck out as a, a really you know, good route. You know, I think making pharmaceutical compounds may, would have a bigger impact than the next Ben and Jerry flavor. So that's kind of why I, I went that route. Thank you for sharing. And um, quick question. So how was your experience as a first gen, like PhD student, was there like any obstacles that you faced? Um, any imposter syndrome, anything like that? <laughs> uh, imposter syndrome is going to happen to anybody, whether they're first generation or not, I think. It's a pretty common thing. Um, I, I'm not really sure if uh, me being a first generation changed too much once I got to grad school. Um, 
I had a little bit of an idea of what it was going to be like because I did undergraduate research. So I was around grad students. I kind of saw a little bit of it, but not being the one experiencing their exact position uh, means I wasn't really prepared for how much like of a stress grad school can be. Like it's it's a lot, you know, it's it's tiring mentally, physically, emotionally. It's I know it, it's tough because you're going to be dealing with a lot of failure and you need to be okay with that. That's part of science is just failing constantly until something succeeds. And that was really hard for me at first. Um, I think my first year of grad school is probably my hardest. But that was also the time where I started figuring out that I liked teaching more. So I was kind of lucky that I had um, the support system that I did here. So my PIs that I worked with were very supportive of my like desire to teach. So they allowed me to you know, pursue that more. I went and did um, like training programs up in Monterey and Santa Cruz. I taught over the summer instead of doing research. And um, I uh, designed courses like 6CL that's being taught here right now. Me and a few other grad students put that together and um, that's now like a standard course that's taught here. So I got to do a lot of stuff that was for teaching and that really made my graduate school career a lot more enjoyable because I got to do something I really enjoyed. But um, I, like I said, I don't think my first generation status really changed things unless, you know, you're a, like a child of someone who went through the PhD process, then you might have a more of an insight of what it's gonna be like, but still, um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and cool question. So throughout your career, were there any like sacrifices that you had to make through this process, like personal, uh, academic, academic ones? Um, hmm. I don't know. I, I think I, one thing that, um, so while I was applying for grad schools, I you know, like applied a couple of them, right? And I was trying to take the advice of my letter writers and people down at UC San Diego that were helping me get to grad school. Um, and they kept pushing me go, you know, go to UCLA. It's like, I got into there and they're like, it's, you know, it's a big name, big program, all that stuff. And, um, you know, like I went to the visitation and nobody seemed happy there. And like all the grad students had some complaint and I don't know if it was because I was, it was raining while I was there or something, but like the trip just kind of left me with a bad taste in my mouth. And I kind of decided to go to UCSB mostly because of the trips. Um, I ignored the advice of, say, of all the people that are like, oh, that's a better school, better program, better whatever. And I went with something that I thought would make me happier, um, something where I could be more comfortable and, uh, you know, have maybe hopefully a little bit better mental health. But <laughs> I think like that was a big part of my decision is trying to get somewhere that I think I could survive. And I think sacrificing the, you know, better school for somewhere that would make me happier. I think maybe that might be one of my only sacrifices I can think of. Well, I'm happy that uh, UCSB made you happy with your <laughs> academic journey. Um, so you talked a, bit, a little bit about mental health in that previous uh, answer. So were there any uh, methods that you were able to use to preserve your mental health or just to make sure to check in on yourself during this academic process? Um, like I said, my first year was pretty rough for me. Um, I eventually realized that, you know, work-life balance is very important. So I cut back on working those 14-hour days, six days a week, and went, okay, I need more time for myself. I need to, you know, cut those back maybe 10-hour days. That'll be better. And maybe do like a half day on a weekend instead of a full day and try to give myself more time to just de-stress. And that meant that I tried to pick up my hobbies again and stuff like that. But, you know, like it's, it's never like, you're never constantly good. It's always kind of up and down, up and down. So like, I'd always find myself at some point in grad school, like gaining weight, being so sad about something and going like, why is everything so terrible? And I go, oh wait, I'm not doing any of my hobbies anymore. I'm not exercising. I'm not like doing the things that make me happy. And 
every time I like, I would realize that I'd like try and stop and make myself do those things. And I like, think that would usually help a lot, but I also started using caps at one point. I can't remember exactly what year it was, but that was pretty helpful. Just, you know, sitting down and talking with somebody. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's, it's something that it's hard to see, you know, it's that old thing that I uh, can't see the forest through the trees kind of thing. Well, you're in it, it's hard to notice sometimes. So um, it's nice to try and take a step back and reevaluate why you're feeling the way you are. Yeah, one can get really caught up with work and stuff and get distracted. Um, actually, Daniela asked a question. Uh, they asked, did UCSB feel more like home versus UCSD? Um, I don't know. It's, I, I like both places a lot and they're very similar because they're both like beachy towns, kind of laid back uh, feeling to them. But um, I think Santa Barbara, I've been here a lot longer. I was only down at UC San Diego for two years. Um, so Santa Barbara definitely feels more like home now. Um, but initially, I definitely had a lot that I missed from San Diego. It's a bigger city, so there's a lot more to do. But the thing I missed the most was the food. <laughs> San Diego has so much more like selection in food and at different price ranges and all that. Like all the best food in Santa Barbara, I feel like I have to pay a lot more for. So I think that's the only thing that I missed. But I mean, Santa Barbara is great. And, I mean, I, st I stayed here. <laughs> I definitely didn't want to leave. No, that's great. Um, we also have another question from David. What is graduate school like? What would someone expect on a regular day? Um, so it might surprise a lot of people to know that even though you spend maybe five years in graduate school, you only take classes for maybe one of those years. The most of most of your time is spent doing research. Um, so that means you show up in the morning, go into lab, do all of your experiments, maybe come sit down at your desk and drink some coffee, work through your results, um, and just keep doing that pretty much every day. Um, your experience will change a lot depending on your PI and your lab mates, though. So um, some PIs are going to be a little bit more hands-on. So, sorry, uh, PIs are your principal investigators. These are the professors that you're working for. So, um, my PI when I got here initially was a young professor who was untenured. So, he really wanted to, you know, look good. So, he was very hands-on. He would come in the lab, you know, once a day at least, check in, see like, hey, how are you guys doing? What experiments are you running? Why are you running those? What do you expect to do next? Kind of things like that. And we'd have weekly meetings with the whole research group together where we'd um, have maybe one to two people present on what they've done. And then we could talk about those results together and maybe like, you know, say like, hey, here's a problem that I'm having. I don't really know how to approach it yet. And then other people can, you know, contribute to that and help each other out. So. I really like that aspect of it, the collaborative nature where, where we're all kind of working on our own projects, but we can still talk to each other about them and spitball ideas and stuff like that. So I think that's one thing I really liked about grad school was just working with people and kind of working towards an answer. Um, but yeah, in, in the, any given day, you're mostly just doing research. And um, I, I was an early person. I'd come in at seven and leave at seven <laughs> or five or something like that. But there are other people on campus that, you know, sleep in, come in at noon and go home at like midnight or something. So it's kind of a little bit more free where you can make your own schedule. But once again, that's up to your PI. Some of them are gonna be a little bit more strict. Like I want everyone here at the same time. So I know exactly what's going on. My second PI that I worked with here is a lot more hands-off. Um, I would see her maybe once a week. I don't know, we, she would schedule meetings with me and then she would miss them. She was much more hands off. So that was a very different, different experience. And uh, I did not do as well in that environment. I am a chronic procrastinator. So I really liked having a like more hands on person that was, you know, kept like coming in and poking me like, what are you doing? What are you doing to keep me on track with stuff? But um, that made the latter half of grad school a little bit tougher without that uh, that level of 
you know, involvement from the professor. Um, Danielle has another question, um, which is a question I also had. Um, when you applied to grad school, did you get to choose the research topic and the PI? How does the chemistry grad department work? So uh, that will likely uh, change depending on where you go. Um, some schools will want you to kind of apply to a specific lab or um, kind of a specific area that you want to get into. But another reason I really liked uh, UC Santa Barbara was because they had a um, rotation schedule set up where you'd come in and you got to kind of rotate between three labs and see which one you liked the most, which one clicked with you, which one you fit in the best, um, which one had the most interesting research or the best group dynamic. Um, so that was that was a really nice thing. And I, I think that's becoming a little more common, but um, I'm not exactly up to date with, with what all the other schools do for their programs. But. And uh, remaining on the PI topic, David asks, when a PI is not as hands-on, how did you keep yourself accountable and not procrastinate? Um, the fear of what the PI would say at our next meeting. <laughs> if I show up with nothing to say or no results or something like that, that's terrifying because you know that they would get mad. Um, so that was a big motivator is fear, which I did not like. Um, and that did not go well with somebody like me who, like I said, is a chronic procrastinator. So um, it was kind of hard to stay motivated at times, but it was also nice because I had a lot of, like my, my group mates were my friends. I still hang out with some of them and um, others have graduated and moved off to different locations, but like it was nice to be able to come in the lab and hang out with them occasionally. And um, so that was a good reason to be in the lab because I got to, you know, do my experiments and just like talk and joke with them at the same time. So it was, was kind of nice in that regard. So, um, yeah. yeah. Nice. And then we have another question from David is, did you ever TA during graduate school? <laughs> oh, <Or> yeah. Teaching <laughs> assistant? Um, so when I came to UCSB, they're like, oh, you guys will have to uh, TA for a minimum of two quarters. And there will be a maximum of nine quarters. Um, that's what they told us. And that was a lie. I TA'd for a total of 21 quarters. Um, most of that was, you know, something I wanted to do. So that was kind of nice. But I, it still definitely slowed down the research because TAing is time consuming. Um, I mean, depending on who you are. Some people don't care about it and don't spend a lot of time for it. And I'm sure many of you have encountered TAs like that. Um, but that was not me. I, like I said, I liked teaching. I liked interacting with students. So it consumed more time than it probably should have uh, for me. But um, yeah, I really liked it. Would you say TAing like helped develop your passion for teaching? Oh yeah. I would have not been exposed to teaching at all otherwise. I mean, like I, I'm also a very big uh, fan of board games. I play those a lot or used to before the pandemic. Um, and I've always been referred to as like the rule master. I was the one who like just taught the games to everybody who played with me. So like teaching is something I've always done. Like it's something that I've, I guess, done naturally, but doing it in terms of like teaching subject matter to somebody like that was a unique experience for me like teaching chemistry so i ended up really enjoying that and sticking with it nice what's your favorite board game <laughs> oh there's too many to <laughs> i i have a big collection behind me but um i think probably one of my recent favorites is gloomhaven just because it's a big interactive long long game <laughs> Um, I actually missed a couple questions on top of the chat, but um, did you ever doubt your major when you were facing challenges? This goes back to the challenging poll. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I did my searching back when I was in community college. I, like, I took a variety of classes. I tried to see, like, I, I always knew it was going to be something STEM. Um, that I knew since high school. But when I got to community college and I was trying to figure things out, it was like, oh, is it going to be physics? Is it going to be math? Is it going to be chemistry? 
And chemistry was really something that uh, I, I enjoyed because you can use it to explain so much of the world around us. And um, that was something that really drew me in. And I liked the, like, you know, just being able to explain like, oh yeah, this is why this home remedy works to remove skunk odor. This is why transition lenses work. This is why you can make a car paint that heals itself when you shine a UV light on it. Like all those little like interesting techno technological things that are explained through chemistry, that really drew me in and kept me interested. Um, and then I had a lot of good professors in those subjects, not my other ones. <laughs> I didn't have very many good physics professors, unfortunately. And I had always, like, I think every chemistry professor I had, I really enjoyed. So that probably helped a lot with keeping me on the subject. But that's not to say that, you know, people won't have those doubts when they're doing or not doing well. But you got to remember that, you know, your grades are not the most important indicator of whether or not you'd be a, su a success in your field. Like curiosity and, um, just like a commitment to the subject is a little more important, I think. Thank you for those reminders. Um, another question from Winnie is, what is your best memory as a grad student at UCSC? Hmm. Uh, I was actually thinking about this the other day. Um, I organized an interdepartmental slosh ball competition with some of my friends in the chemistry department and we played against people in the poli sci and history and geology departments, and it was just a blast. Um, so I think that was one of my favorite things that we did. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing. There's actually a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so from mm -hmm. Erica, did you ever struggle with keeping up with your grade slash GPA? If so, how did you go about that and go on an upward trend? Um, Let's see, I didn't really have too many difficulties. Um, community college wasn't too difficult. I think uh, the level of academic rigor is a bit lower than you know the UC system, so that wasn't too bad. But when I got to the UC, um, my first quarter, I you know just organic chemistry just clicked with me, so. Um, that wasn't too bad. And at that point, that was my major chemistry class I was taking. So that was when I was transitioning to the quarter system. So I got to uh, make that transition while taking a subject that just worked for me. Um, and then when I got to the, some of the harder uh, courses a little bit later, the later OCHEM ones, or for me, biochemistry was really hard. Um, I got kind of lucky with some of those classes. My biochemistry teacher was um, one of those teachers that don't really care about teaching too much. Um, he, you know, he had like a whole building on campus that was his, it was come to school in his Ferrari kind of thing. Like he was there for research and he was teaching only because he had to. Um, and it kind of came across with how he conducted the class. He was like, okay, everything's open book, open note show up with your textbook for an exam that's totally fine and like I didn't learn anything in that class but I still made it through it and like like that's one thing that kept me going through that class is just because like I, I could get through it with uh, having those little aids but I think I would have done a lot worse if it wasn't set up in that way. Um, my physical chemistry class was really hard. Um, the average for some of our exams were like 30 or 40 percent. But, you know, me doing really poorly in that class was okay because everybody else was. Uh, so curves, curves saved me. Um, but anytime I really had a, um, like a subject I didn't really get or I did poorly on a portion of exam or a quiz or something, um, I would always go to my TAs. Um, they were pretty helpful. Um, one thing that I really liked at, about UCSD that I wish UC, UCSB would do is that we had sections for every lecture. So my all my lectures had several TAs that were attached to them. And then like my 300 person lecture would get par like parsed down into these little 20 person sections. And each of those 20 person sections would meet with a TA once a week. 
And those sections were such a huge help for getting through my classes. And um, I would definitely talk to the TAs and get the help I needed. Those sound very effective and very much needed here at UCSB. <laughs> Um, Stephanie has a question, not a serious question, but do you ever feel like your last name Lewis is a coincidence with the, with your field of study? <laughs> um, I, I remember seeing Lewis structures for the first time and going, <laughs> Hey, I'm famous already. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I'll take that. Yeah. It's a definitely good coincidence or fate or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> let's, let's, let's call it fate. And then David has a question, also off topic. When you're watching your lectures, I hear a dog bark once in a while. Can you tell us about your pets? I also heard the dog right now. Yeah, uh, I have a 10-year-old beagle. She's going to be turning 11 this year. Um, she is a lazy dog who just sleeps all the day, all day most of the time. But she's entirely motivated by food, like most beagles. Um, I also have two cats. Uh, Oh, wait, sorry, my, my dog, uh, the beagle is named Stella. Um, she uh, was originally my fiance because I didn't meet Stella until she was three. Um, but her full name is Stella Louise Tiberius Brian and then Munson, which is my fiance's last name. So long name, a little bit of Star Trek in there, a little bit of Harry Potter in there. So um, Good name. And then I have two cats. Uh, one of them is Harley Quinn. She's the one that you hear yelling in all my lecture videos. Um, she's a black and white tux tuxedo cat. Um, and then my last cat is very silent. You'll never hear him in any of the videos, but uh, he's just, um, uh, his name is Kaladin and he's a tabby. So he he's named after one of my favorite, uh, a character in one of my favorite book series. In the chat, everyone is saying it's uh, obligated to show your pets now. So, <laughs> all right, let, let me let me get the dog at least. The cats don't come when you call them, as most of you probably know. <laughs> Stella. Yeah. For all the students, if you want to unmute yourself and ask um, Dr. Lewis personally a question, feel free to do so. But if not, continue uh, asking the questions in the chat. All right, let's Stella. Um, she's angry because it's dinner time. I usually feed her at five when this thing started. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> All right, I'm going to kick her out because her toes are really loud. Thank you for that. That was, they're yeah. so cute. Stella's very <laughs> cute. <laughs> um, continuing on with questions, how would you suggest students uh, to go about building a rapport with professors and asking for a letter of rec? Um, you know, for me, it's like when pe students ask, it's, I can like look through my emails and uh, <clears throat> see if I recognize any, or see if I can have any communications with them from those or I'll look on my old Gaucho Space page and see um, like what their picture is. So I'm like, oh yeah, I recognize that student. They like were always in the front row or they stayed behind to ask questions after class or, um, you know, like little things like that, just like, you know, show up to office hours occasionally, ask questions after class, send them emails with your questions. Like getting those little bits of communication is usually enough to um, help them like, you know, remember you and, have them develop some sort of like general idea of like, oh yeah, this student asked really good questions or they, they are, you know, seriously committed to understanding the material. Like I, I definitely remember the students who ask um, like those really good, like pointed questions where I'm like, oh dang, you're gonna make me talk about this right now. That's gonna take a lot, a lot more time. Like I wasn't counting on this. So like, I remember those and I think I recognize students by their face a lot more than their names because I see the faces in class all the time, but like I don't always know everybody's name. So, um, you know, just making those appearances, saying hi, and um, like I said, just sticking around after class to ask questions are a great way to kind of build a, at least a foundation for that relationship. And um, they might also be the people that you ask about getting into research as well. Like these are the 
most professors on campus, like, are, I should say this, like, I'm not uh, actually a professor. I am a lecturer, according to the way that things are set up. Uh, professors are the ones that are doing research on campus for the most part, um, at least in, you know, our STEM departments. Um, so if you're, uh, you know, interacting with your professors like a little bit each time after class, maybe asking them for advice on getting into research or things like that, that's, those are just like small, easy ways to build that connection that you could use a little bit later. Thank you. And David, do you have a question? Yeah, it was just, um, you were talking about you being a lecturer and then there's like professors and there's tenured professors. Like I I've heard the terms before, but I don't know exactly what they mean. Like uh, was like each position like and like, I guess the importance of it. Yeah, so um, I am a lecturer. I don't have any research lab. I'm only here to teach. Um, I'm also a specific type of lecturer where um, I don't have a like a permanent contract. I have to get rehired every year essentially. Um, so like, I don't have great job security, but like, I'm, I'm not scared because there's not that many OCHEM professors here. Um, so I think I'll, I'll be fine. Um, but like eventually, you know, like every, like the third year I'll do a little review process. The fifth year I'll do another review process. And at that fifth year mark, I'll get a little bit more uh, permanent of a contract. Um, the research professors are a little bit different. They start off as assistant professors. Um, and then during those next few years, they have to kind of prove themselves. They have to write um, uh, research proposals to get grants to fund their research and bring money into the campus. And then they have to publish papers to show that their research is actually successful and can make it into journals. They have to be part of committees. They have to you know, like do a whole bunch of things to show that they are a valuable member of the campus to get that tenure. Um, so that's one thing I really did not want to do. Like all of that takes away from teaching. Um, the research professors often spends maybe like 10 to 15% of their time on teaching. It's like such a small part of what their, their duties encompass. So that's why you might find some professors that are just not as dedicated to the course as some others seem to be. Um, I liked being able to be a, re, uh, a lecturer, not doing research and be able to focus like all my attention on the class and working with students and stuff like that. Um, I also don't know how other departments do things or other colleges do professorships and stuff like that. So this is true for here in our chemistry department. Thank you for sharing. And Nicholas, you have a question? Yeah, you've uh, mentioned your fiance a few times. How did you two meet? Uh, at UCSB, uh, at what's it called? Uh, fifth grade chemistry outreach. She was not a fifth grader. She was doing the outreach with me. Um, we were both uh, volunteering for that and that's, that's where we met, so. UCSB bringing people together. I love to hear that. Um, I actually do have a question for you. Um, uh, let me look for it really quick. So it, oh, sorry, I'm trying to find it. I have a lot of questions. Oh, yes. So you have great reviews on Rate My Professor or just like word of mouth. People often uh, have high regards of you. Um, and so what, in, uh, so common, common comments about you is that you're very approachable and understanding as a professor. Uh, what inspired you to be this kind of instructor? Uh, having instructors that were like that for me, um, like it made such a world of difference to feel like I could go ask questions and I wouldn't be ridiculed or, you know, they wouldn't be like, oh, you should just read that in the syllabus or something. Like being in that kind of environment was so good for me that I wanted to try and replicate it um, myself. But I also, uh, like I was talking about earlier, went to some teaching and training programs that talked about pedagogy and just like how to uh, get students to do well. And one of the big things I found was that um, student success can really be tied to the environment in the classroom. And 
like hearing that was just like really cemented like yeah I really need to try and make a environment where students feel like they can come talk to me feel like they can ask me questions or they can say like hey I really just need another day or two to finish this assignment I'll be like yeah sure go for it like I'd much rather you guys learn something and complete this than you know like penalize you for some random arbitrary deadline like really the whole point of you guys being here is to learn something it's not to make sure you guys can stick to some random schedule like I just want you guys to learn and I need uh, you guys to come talk to me to do that which is why I want to be open and inviting. Thank you for creating that environment for the students. Um, uh, another question from the chat from earlier is why do some professors make their courses challenging with exams that give low averages of 40% like your physical chem class? I'm not sure what that meant. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a reference back to uh, saying my PCHEM class when averages were so low, but curve saved us. Um, I think it part of it is just kind of going back to what they experienced. Um, you know, that's kind of what it used to be like for the most part is just like, if you can't make the grade, you don't cut it, you don't belong here kind of thing. So it is really a sink or swim kind of environment. And I mean, I think, a lot of them will bring that into the, when they teach then. Um, low averages are also a way to create a greater distribution of grades. Um, they allow for curves. They, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure exactly everyone's motivation. Sometimes it's just like, hey, you guys should be able to do this because I can do it. And, you know, it's not a very fair expectation. Uh, so I, I think it's a lack of, uh, you know, good pedagogical reasoning and behind what they're doing and also just, you know, like I said, doing what they've seen before. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, then there's one question. I have no idea. Do sharks produce squalene? Also, oh, I, can ask, I can ask the question. Okay. <laughs> so on behalf of my friend, Alex, she wanted me to ask you if squalene can come from sharks or if sharks are able to produce squalene. Um, and then the second question is like, have you heard of the Gorilla Glue Girl? And like, what do you think of like the, <laughs> the solvent that was able to remove the industrial glue off her head? Um, I'll have to say, I don't know to both those things. I heard of the Gorilla Glue Girl, but I don't, I didn't hear what happened. I just, I just heard that what she did. And I was like, why? <laughs> Um, and that was kind of where I left that story. Um, as far as squalene and sharks, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> What's that? Squalene, remember? It is a type of compound that is squarish in shape, so it has the name squalene. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Um, and the chat, people are saying, Lewis is the best, Lewis is the best. <laughs> That's a nice comment. Um, let's see. So um, talking a little bit more about like the transition online, um, how has COVID and the transition online learning affected you as a lecturer um, and affected your ability to teach? Uh, it's honestly, it's a lot more work. Uh, initially, especially trying to get everything set up and organized and lectures recorded and questions written for exams because I couldn't exactly import things I used in person to an online setting because you know, we're limited in the types of questions we can ask. A lot of my OCHEM exams before were much more open-ended, much less multiple choice. And like, I can't ask people to draw out a molecule as easily in on like an online quiz as I could in person. So it was a lot more kind of reconfiguring how I approach things or taught stuff, but I think one big change I made was, well, it wasn't really a change, but it was like a re-emphasis on uh, being understanding and compassionate and like all my interactions, cause like it's, it's rough. Like I know nobody's gonna be, like I'll never be able to understand what everyone's going through, but I'm just trying to be as understanding as possible and um, forgiving as possible for like, you know, exams or not exams for um, assignments and stuff like that. I'll extend deadlines and all that. Um, so the, the part of the transition that was hard for me is trying to, like, I, I think I said this earlier, find the balance between like work life and home life. And, 
uh, trying to figure out where I should cut that off. Like I, I set myself a deadline of like, I have to stop working at like 5.30. Don't respond to emails after that or else I'd be like responding to emails at like 10.30 at night and going, why am I doing this? <laughs> so like, I've tried to set those little like personal health, like mental health, a uh, little check marks for me. Like, don't do this, don't do this and take some time to yourself, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the transition online has been nice for some things and bad for others. Like it's definitely affecting students disproportionately. I feel like the students that would do well in person are doing well online anyways. It's the students that would that need more help are the ones that are kind of falling behind. Um, but I'm also seeing a lot more students reaching out for help, which is kind of nice. And I don't know if that's because it's, you know, in this digital format and you can hide behind your computer more or if it's because they need more help. But either way, I really like the increase in student teacher interaction because like I've said before, I really enjoy that. And I love doing office hours. I like answering, you know, students questions and guiding them towards, you know, like, like that aha moment. Like that's, that's so great. That's like a runner's high kind of thing. Or when you like see them go, oh, that makes so much sense now. So like, I like working with students to get them there. Thank you for sharing your compassion with the students. It's been definitely difficult times. And David, do you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, I'm currently in your organic chemistry course, come on online A, and um, now it's obviously online and it's instructed online. I'm kind of curious what it was like in person and the experience that it would have been like the lecture hall or like the lectures formatted and your past experience with it. Um, well, so my background is where the lecture would have been. Um, so I would usually be just walking back and forth and writing on those boards behind me. Um, my lectures are pretty much the same. Like I, I have my lecture notes that I spent writing my first, you know, few quarters that I was teaching, and um, I use those as the basis for my videos. And I use the same ones for my in-person lectures. So the content doesn't change too much, but I kind of prefer how it's delivered in the videos, um, just because I have the ability to like change colors and um, kind of easily scroll back to things or whatever I need to do for that, like drop in pictures a little bit easier. Whereas in person, I'm writing with chalk on the board and erasing things as I go. And um, like the pacing is also a little bit uh, higher in person. Um, I like that you guys can pause the videos and stuff like that. So um, that would be a major difference. But one thing that I miss is some of the little things I used to do, like uh, when we're learning about chair conformers or stereochemistry, I had like really big models that I could bring in and show like, hey, this is how a chair flip works. And I'd take the molecule and just like flip it. And you could like actually physically see the change. And like that would click for a lot of people. And it's kind of hard to do that when you're not in person. Um, I'd also, when we're talking about stereochemistry, I'd bring in uh, molecules that were in like, or compounds that are in two different vials that were taped together. It's like this, this file has the R enantiomer, this one has the S enantiomer. So you can like open it up and smell it and then open the other one and smell it. And you can see that they were, they smell completely different. So like, I, I like to do that to emphasize that these compounds, even though they look almost similar, the enantiomers are very different. So like, I like being able to do little things like that in person. Thanks for sharing. Um, and then we do have a question from Bernina. Will you utilize the videos you made this quarter once things are back in person? That's something I've been thinking about. I've, I think I might switch up how I teach once uh, normal classes start up again. I might do like one day a week where it's a flip schedule where I'll say like, hey, watch these lecture videos instead of a lecture. And when you come to class, we'll do practice problems because I, I think students love practice problems and I just can't fit too many of them into a lecture because we have to get through a certain amount of material by the end of the quarter and it's hard like I don't have time to make those connections to interesting topics outside of the class that's why I use bacon in my class it's you know it lets students uh so for those of you that don't know bacon is uh biology and chemistry online notes 
it's a program that like connects the subject that you're learning to you know pop culture stuff sports movies whatever um, so it makes those connections I don't really have the time to make in class um, so yeah that that's one thing like if I can do that flip schedule like one day a week I can spend some time doing practice problems talking about those cool connections and now that I have that material already produced, it would be easy to make that net switch. So I think I think I'll probably end up changing things in the future. That sounds really awesome. Um, and would you mind just asking three more questions? I know we're a little bit over time, but I do want to respect everyone's schedule. Okay, so we have three more questions. Um, the first one's kind of funny. Nicholas, do you make the memes you share with us yourself? <laughs> I most of them. Uh, probably like 90% of the ones I share, I make. Um, some of them I find through either my friends sending them to me or on like a chemistry meme page. So um, most of them come from me though. I do remember your memes from when I took the course. Um, and then Kendall asked, what was the hardest chemi chemistry class you ever took? Um, one of my physical chemistry courses, I took three physical chemistry courses. So probably um, thermodynamics was just a little hard for me. I don't know why some that subject just didn't click with me. Um, it's the same way with like uh, physics for electricity and magnetism. That was like my absolute worst grade in all of college was that class. I just could not understand it. Like circuits, I don't even know what's going on, but you know, chemistry, that's, that was fine with me. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, physical organic chemistry is also pretty tough. So it's like, you know, in organic chemistry, you're like, hey, molecules have this bond angle, deal with it. We don't tell you why. In physical organic chemistry, it's like, all right, let's set up this matrices and do these matrix calculations using linear algebra and do a full page of work. And yep, that's your bond angle now. It's like all the math and the reason behind those bond angles. And it was, it was really tough, but it was kind of cool to see. So that was another, uh, another one that I definitely remember sticking out as a challenge. Yeah, that sounds really tough. <laughs> um, and just last question, uh, what's some advice you have for the students now who are pursuing just any higher education or just trying to finish the chemistry series now? Let's see. Uh, general advice. Um, I would say that you are much more capable than you think you are. Um, I know imposter syndrome is rough, but uh, it's usually not true. So <laughs> don't listen to yourself. Um, you're usually your, wor your own worst enemy. Um, so just, you know, keep at it, find the help that you need. Like if you need help, don't feel like, like, sorry, sorry, let me rephrase this. If you're having difficulty with something, don't feel like you have to shoulder that and push through and suffer. Like asking for help is not a weakness. It is a sign of strength. It is something that you should develop, a skill that's important. So find that help if you need it, whether it's through, you know, caps for some mental health issues, through your TAs or instructors for issues with the subject, like whatever it is, finding help is important. And it's a very valuable skill. You're going to be working with other people throughout your career. You're not going to be going at it alone. Going at it alone. Thank you for the advice, Dr. Lewis. Um, and it looks like we're a little bit over time, but I just want to thank Dr. Lewis and everyone here who came at doing this professor after hours and shared this hour of community. We really appreciate it. Um, make sure to visit Dr. Lewis at his office hours. He seems to love to talk to you. Um, and yeah, in the future, we'll be working with Dr. Lewis at the OSC, so make sure to look at that. And just one last thing before we leave, uh, the OSC is open uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. So make sure to come and talk to us. And if you'd like to see more collaborations with Dr. Lewis or with other professors, uh, let us know. And thank you so much for yeah, coming. Thank you guys for showing up and asking questions. I had fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs>